so as i shared with you the entire session will be dividing into two parts the first part would be more about the different leadership styles that we have and the second part would be about one of the things which is a suspense for all of you it is about how pcr mindset powers a leader now what is this pcr you will come to know when we'll go to this second part of the session and uh, while going to the first part which is talking about six different leadership style we'll start with a small assessment so what i'm doing is i am pasting a link in the chat box and there is a word that document which is about assessing your natural leadership style so there is a link that i'm sharing in the chat box so you can just visit this particular link agree to the terms and conditions there and you can download a word document from there which is about assessing your leadership style and once you all download this word document i'll give you the set of instructions how we have to fill this particular questionnaire which is about 10 statements are there in this particular word document i request all the faculty members to please download this word document from this link which is about assessing your leadership style ankush sir i am resending the link in the chat box once again here it is thank you sir thank you sir faculty members who have downloaded this document can you please uh, write it in the chat box so that i'll come to know like uh, what is the number of people who have downloaded this do document and then we can go ahead with the set of instructions how to fill this up okay thank you so much rewardan gautam sir reena ma'am thank you thank you sushil ji right so i'm just taking a confirmation so that i'll be able to know whether you are able to download this document or not although i have tested it my at my end but i just wanted to make it sure that you are also able to download it right so let's wait for another 2 minutes where most of us present here should download this word document and open it and i'll give you the next set of instructions how we have to fill those 10 statements okay should i go ahead with the set of instructions okay so as you all know if you go through that particular document also it's already written there that there is no right or wrong answer for the 10 statements which are being mentioned on page number 1 and 2 there are 10 different situations which are being mentioned here based on your particular own nature what would be your answer in case of statement 1 2 or till 10 right if you are being facing such kind of situation what would be the best solution as per you you have to tick that particular option or if you are doing it on your laptop you can make that particular statement bold or in a different color so that you will be able to know that what is the right option that you have chosen for statement 1 or for other statements which are being mentioned in that word document and how much time do you think we should get to fill this particular document page number 1 and 2 we'll not go to the scoring sheet right now because there is a way of filling the scoring sheet also that i'll be sharing it with you once you are done with that leena ma'am please do mark it in your word document uh, i'll request don't uh, put it here in the chat box for all those 10 statements mark it there in your word document and once you all are done with that then i'll tell you how you have to calculate the scores part 
but till that time take some time to read those 10 different statements and what is the right option you'll choose out of that i hope the instructions are quite clear can anyone of uh, us uh, means you present here please confirm uh, i hope the instructions are clear Okay, thank you so much, Sharda ma'am. And how much time uh, do you think we should get for this particular assessment? Fifteen minutes, perfectly fine. Even I was also thinking fifteen minutes. Let's not go beyond that. It's two forty, and uh, let's stop at two fifty-five. And I'll tell you how we have to do the scoring part, and how we'll come to know about our own natural leadership style. And faculty members who are joining us in last one or two minutes, who have joined us right now or who are joining us right now, they can again confirm that what we are doing because for next 10 minutes, there would be a lot of silence also. They might not be in a situation to understand that what other faculty members are doing. So in case if you have any doubts, you are most welcome to unmute and ask what we are doing right now. We are just going ahead with a self-assessment on natural leadership style. Whosoever is uh, done with the 10 statements can write it in the chat box so that we'll come to know like majority of you have done it or uh, a lot of people are still left doing it because the scoring sheet is a bit different and I have to give you uh, again a set of instructions how to fill that up.
Thank you, Lena, ma'am, for confirming that you are done with this. And I request all of the faculty members also, as soon as you are done with those two pages, 10 statements, please do write it in the chat box. We'll come to know. And when most of you are done with that, I'll go to the scoring sheet where you'll be able to calculate the scoring part. Thank you, Nivita, for confirming. Thank you, Sushil, sir. Thank you, Ravish, sir, for confirming that you have also done it. <clears throat> Once I receive more than 10 responses where people are done with the assessment, I'll give you the set of instructions for filling up the scoring sheet. Thank you, Sharda, ma'am. Thank you, Amritesh, sir. Thank you, Monk, sir. I think we have more than 10 faculty members who are done with this assessment. But let's wait for another two minutes. Thank you, Vijay Kumarji. OK, should I go ahead with the instructions how to fill the scoring sheet in uh, leadership profile? is on third page thank you rakesh sir okay lena ma'am so i'll take an example where lena ma'am has given option b for statement number one now how we have to fill the scoring sheet is if you see that scoring sheet it is having six different sections section one that is column one then section two section three till section six there are six different columns so let's take an example where in the chat box, Lina Mham has shared that for statement number one, she has chosen option B. So if you see the scoring sheet, option B is mentioned in column number two. So Lina Mham, you have to write one in, one in front of B and zero should be mentioned in all other options. Please do it for the first statement. People who have chosen some other option like C, D, E, or F. So wherever, in whichever column C, D, E, F for statement number one is mentioned, there you have to mention one. And for all other options, you have to mention zero. I hope I'm making the statement or uh, the set of instructions clear to all of you. Right? OK. So Sharda ma'am, in the same way, there are other statements for which you have chosen other options. So again, that scoring sheet, let's suppose, let's suppose if Sharda ma'am, you have chosen option D in statement number two. So in first column, you will write one, but in all other columns, you will mention zero. So whichever option you have chosen for that particular statement, in front of that option, you'll write one, but for all other options, you'll write zero. So for all 10 statements or all 10 rows, you have to write it in binary format one and zero. Hope the instructions are clear. Because often it becomes very easy to 
make you understand those things but i think online it takes some time thank you vinita ma'am for confirming through thumbs up so in the same way you can do it for all 10 statements and the moment you are done with all those 10 statements do let me know by writing it in the chat box because then i'll share the last thing that we have to do how we have to calculate the score and of course one more thing after the scoring there are different six different leadership styles so you will be able to assess your natural leadership style thank you lena ma'am confirming that you are done with that let's wait for another three four responses then i'll tell you how we have to calculate the scores thank you sushil sir okay thank you anuradha ma'am thank you so i think most of you are almost done with those 10 statements now you can well imagine from this particular sheet also you have to do total column wise do a total column wise all six columns should have a total okay parul ma'am you are also done thank you so much thank you thank you so much so i think you are done with the totals for six different columns also now i think it is a time to unmute and share rather than writing it in the chat box i think almost all of you are done with the total for six different columns right okay so now my question is column 1 is your column 1 is your should i share it with you or should i ask you what kind of leadership style would be there in column 1 i think it would be hard to judge but let me share it with you column 1 is your commanding leadership style column 1 is your commanding leadership style column 2 is your democratic leadership style and column 3 is your affiliative leadership style column 4 is visionary leadership style column 5 is pace setting leadership style and column 6 is coaching leadership style now the most interesting part do you want me to repeat it once again or uh, should i go ahead from here once again okay i'll repeat it column 1 is your commanding leadership style column 2 is democratic leadership style column 3 is affiliative leadership style column 4 is visionary leadership style
column five is pace setting leadership style and column six is coaching leadership style right so let's have some interesting uh, scores here how many of you have scored highest in column one which is commanding leadership style if you can just write it in the chat box or probably you can unmute and share how many of you have scored highest in section one which is commanding leadership style and i hope all of you understand that we have a natural leadership style but in different situations we change our leadership styles also this is how we all uh, work Okay, so Sharda ma'am has written that 80% is visionary leadership style, whereas 20% is coaching leadership style. Good to see those observations. Lena ma'am has written visionary 5, democratic 4. That means she is having a mixture of visionary as well as democratic leadership, right? Affiliated is 1. Very good. We'll talk about these 6 different leadership styles also one by one, but let's uh, see the scores first. And Lena ma'am, do, does it, uh, Lena ma'am and Sharda ma'am, these leadership style, does it resonate with your nature also? Because this becomes a test for the resource person also who has designed it. Okay, right. So thank you so much, Lena ma'am, for confirming. And Sharda ma'am, about you? Okay, right. Can we have some answers from, okay, Amritesh sir has also written my democratic and visionary is equal score and highest. Very good, sir. So good to see a lot of uh, visionary and uh, you can say democratic leaders here. But uh, I think Sharda ma'am is having some coaching leadership mixture also in that. Ankur sir, visionary, democratic, coaching and pace setting out of which democratic is and visionary is the highest. Right. So thank you so much. So let's come to those leadership styles one by one. Commanding leadership style, all of you understand what kind of leaders are commanding leaders or in what kind of situations generally we need commanding leadership. Can any one of you please share an example in what kind of situations do we need commanding leadership? In what kind of situations do we need commanding leadership? Yes, Amitesh, sir, please go ahead. You are free to unmute and share, yeah. sir. Very right. And Lina Mahan has also shared about defense services. And what is the reason why we need commanding leadership and defense? Why don't we go for other leadership sites? Because there the uh, the way of functioning is well defined in advance and all the genius security for the instructions. Maybe Right. So commanding leadership style is generally needed when fast decision making is required and the team trusts the leaders to make good decisions and little or you can say no team involvement is required in that. And it basically saves time and we can get quick results. But sometimes it can affect communications down the line and we might miss certain opportunities where collaboration would identify other options to achieve results. So every leadership style has a positive as well as the other side of the coin also. Let's go to the second type of leadership style, which is democratic leadership style. So democratic leadership style, for all the leadership styles, I'll not ask you questions because we have to keep in mind the time constraint also. And democratic leadership style, we all know about that. Democratic leadership style is needed when we need buy-in from team members to move forward. In this case, the leader involves more people in finding solutions allowing creativity to drive performance forward. And it can create a motivated, well-driven team, can also so slow down the process as people need time to consider the options to move, go forward. Because when we are involving people in taking decisions, sometimes it can slow down the process. But overall, it is a very good leadership style because we are taking a buy-in from other team members and they also feel involved in solving a particular problem. Any idea what is an affiliative leadership style? These leadership styles we all have studied or somehow experienced in our particular uh, professional life also. But what is an affiliative leader? 
Is it a co copy lead through style like we call someone and it is way of the medicine? Uh, sir, can you repeat it once again? I am not able to get you. Uh, uh, is it a, a style where we, wherein we copy the way of uh, leading through some seniors? We just copy how they are doing it and then we just follow it. Right, right. So commanding leaders, they are basically, what they are doing is, their style of leading is through building relationship, close communication, showing empathy. That basically creates a harmonious atmosphere when working through stressful conditions. I'll give you an example. Suppose I'm leading one of the institutes and I'm not a good leader. I'm just giving you an example. And uh, uh, after two years, management asked me to leave this particular organization because due to my particular style, a lot of people working in that institution or let's say industry also, people were not happy or people were demotivated. In that case, I'll take another example. Let's say the institution hired Amritesh sir for that particular position. Since the people were demotivated when Hitesh was leading that particular institution as a leader, so initially Amritesh ji would adopt affiliative leadership style where he would empathize with people because his people are demotivated. But in the longer run, from affiliative, he has to shift to some other leadership style and the best option would be to shift to visionary leadership style. Because affiliative leadership style in longer run is not taken as a positive leadership. Because affiliative leaders, they go so much deep into building harmonious relationship with people. Sometimes they forget, uh, forget about the targets of the organization or you can say the goals of the organization. That is where after a few months, he has to change his leadership style and he has to get into a visionary mode. I think Amritesh sir, you wanted to share something. You have raised a hand. Okay, I'll go forward, Amritesh sir, if you don't have anything to share as of now, right? So this was one example that I have gave uh, regarding how you can uh, adopt this particular leadership style in different circumstances but in the longer run we should not be in affiliative leadership style and then comes the fourth leadership style which is about visionary leadership and visionary leadership is about having inspiring long-term goals that take the department and company forward which creates an atmosphere where team members can build their knowledge and abilities or in short what visionary leadership does is they take care of people working in the organization. They basically take care of their particular happiness index as well as they are concerned about long-term goals of the organization also. And then is the fifth type of leadership style. Any idea what are pace setting leaders? What are pace setting leaders? Pace setter leaders. In fact, uh, Sharda ma'am and Lina ma'am, I'll request you uh, uh, please unmute and share uh, rather than writing in the chat box because that makes it more interactive. Chat, I think still we don't have that connect in the right way. And Pradeep sir, all other faculty members present here, please unmute and share who are basically pace setting leaders or any examples of pace setting leaders. Okay, Lina ma'am, your audio has an issue. No, no issues. You can write in the chat box. Any example of pace setting leaders? Amritesh, Amritesh sir, would you like to share? Sir, you are uh, on mute. Yeah. Sir, sir. Uh, I just I think sir, the base setting leadership style would be when the leader is ready to take new risk or more risk. He is a more risk taker than I think the uh, earlier four styles of leadership. He is more risk taking than democratic and creative leaders. And he is ready to take some new steps. This kind of leaders are I think, called base setting leaders. 
Okay, Amritesh sir, you are saying that they take more risk as compared to visionary and democratic uh, leaders. This is what yes. yes, right, sir. And Amritesh sir, they these leaders are basically target oriented. If we talk about people working in your admission cells, right? Uh, apart from government uh, institutes, if you see the private universities also, people who are working in uh, branding or people who are working in sales and marketing, people who are working in admissions, they are generally pace setting leaders. So they are concerned about the targets and uh, they generally set a pace for the team. They set an example and then they expect the team to be committed and competent to perform as per that particular target. So they basically build a high performance team, pace setting leaders. And last is the coaching leaders who basically build in uh, building the competences of their people working in that particular team. Right. So these are six different leadership styles. And going ahead, we'll talk about few of the competencies that is required in a leader. And we'll take it from industry, you can say industrial evolution one till three. And then we'll also talk about what are the new skills which are being added in this current era and moving forward, what are those skills that we should keep in mind? So some of the skills, I'm just skipping this because already we have covered in one or the other way about these six different leadership styles. These are some of the differences. But to conclude on this, I'll talk about uh, only one thing, which is if you see the last row, the overall impact on climate, if we see this six different leadership styles, in longer run, commanding or pace setting is not considered to be very positive. So if this is being run in the longer run, like if we adopt too much of commanding and pace setting leaders, we might suffer in terms of attrition in the organization. So overall, visionary, affiliative, democratic and coaching is considered as positive. But again, I have another viewpoint here also. Affiliative in longer run is also negative so it should be for the moment like the case that i have shared with you in case if there is rift between the team members or there is somebody in the management who let left a negative impression in the organization and due to which people were demotivated in that case for few months you can say this leadership style affiliative leadership style should be adopted but then it should be shifted to the other you can say orbits which can be either visionary or it can be democratic so talking about uh, the competences which leaders were having till industrial revolution 3 were if we talk in terms of people competences it was coaching and mentoring leadership and empowerment communication interpersonal and management by objectives conflict management and ethical practices business practices and prioritization in terms of processes it was very important for leaders to have that strategic planning and analyzing decision making and process to engineering competencies and related to technology and innovation. And in terms of change management, it was flexibility, criticism and custodian, or you can say uh, positive uh, means uh, constructive criticism. In terms of business acumen, it was I have missed one word, which is political, best political, economical, social and technological stakeholders and financials coming to industrial revolution four or you can say the current era which is the era of digitalization a leader in terms of people should have competencies like he or she should become more collaborative emotional intelligence should be there obviously it was there earlier also but due to fast changing things in last 50 years I think this has become one of the most important competency for a leader, emotional intelligence or emotional balance. And they have to shift their orbit from ego to humbleness. So that is the reason in terms of people competencies, they have to become humbly confident. In terms of processes, it should be tech savvy, adaptive and authentic. And in terms of change management, it should be actively agile, resilient and quick learners. In terms of business acumen, they should be visionary culturally intelligent, courageous, and intuitive. I'm sorry for taking this last two slides a bit fast because we'll spend some more time on the second part, which is a very interesting part. And here comes the second part for you. So the second part is about, second part is about how PCR mindset powers the leader. 
So before I start sharing about PCR mindset, thank you so much, Lina, ma'am. You have written pace reader setting is one who takes group and pace as per society driven decisions or requirements. Right, right. Thank you so much, Lina, ma'am. Now my question to all of you present here is, what would be PCR mindset here? And the moment I say PCR, what is the first thing that comes in your mind? The second section is about how PCR mindset will power the leader. And I'm repeating once again, what is the first thing that comes to your mind when I'm saying PCR? I prefer taking sessions with some humor, so that is the reason I play with acronyms. Rashmi, ma'am, how was PCR discovered? Uh, no, I, I, this is not too much serious, but this has some relevance with the mindset. What kind of mindset leader should build? I'll give you a hint. PCR is something which we move when we move within a city. We see a lot of we see a lot of police vans. So if you can now make a guess, what would be PCR? What is the first thing which comes to our mind when we talk about PCR? I hope some of our faculty members should be able to guess it. PCR. Let's try to, uh, Amritesh said it would not be loud and aggressive leaders. I'm just asking you what would be the full form of PCR here? Any idea what would be the full form production of civil rights? Okay, let me sh open it for you because otherwise we'll get late. Generally, when we talk about PCR, the first thing that comes to our mind is police control room. Am I right or am I wrong? Police control room. Am I right or am I wrong? When the word PCR comes. Right, Sunita, ma'am. But here, the PCR would be having a different, you can say, full form. But obviously, when we talk about when police is there, police control room is there, we follow certain disciplines also, right? So this PCR here would help us in following that particular discipline. And here, PCR is, I am writing it in the chat box, it's progressive, collaborative, resilient mindset. So this is the full form that I have made for PCR, it's progressive, collaborative, and resilient mindset. And how it powers the leader, I'll take you through a small story, or you can say through a small case study. Um, uh, before I start explaining the case study, I just wanted to ask all the faculty members when this new education policy was uh, shared with the institutions. Uh, in last two or three years, what is the percentage of change that you are uh, facing in your particular organization? How your processes and systems are being changed in last three years? Just an approximate figure in terms of percent out of hundred percent. What kind of or how many how much percentage changes are coming in your processes and systems when this new education policy was introduced? Can any one of you please unmute and answer? Or if you want to write it in chat box, you're most welcome. In the last three years, when NISP is already there, new education policy is also there, 
what is the percentage of changes that you are feeling in your particular institutions? Let's have quick answer. It's already 3.18 and I'm left with 42 minutes only. Because if time will allow, we'll go with another self-assessment towards the end. But again, it depends on the time. If the time will allow, then only we'll go ahead with that. I'm repeating my question once again. No changes, Sushil, sir? OK, no new processes and no new systems introduced. Any of the institutions or any of the faculty members present here who witnessed some changes in their process and systems. More online courses awareness, Vinita, ma'am. Thank you so much. Can we have more answers? Okay, I think the lunch is playing a good role here. We don't want to unmute and answer. OK. OK, let me straight away go to all three parameters, which is P, C, and R. So we'll first take uh, the P part, which is the progressive part. Now, as I shared with you, P is your progressive, C is collaborative, R is resilient. And I'm skipping this slide, which is about uh, the thinking part, because keeping in mind the time constraint, I'll go a bit fast here. But let's start from here. I'll try to do it in five minutes, right? My question to all the faculty members present here, when we go for different phases in change, when this new education policy, or even if we take a case of COVID also, when we were being introduced with Zoom, WebEx, MS Teams, and uh, Gravardhan, sir, I'll be sharing these slides uh, with uh, Rama ma'am, and you can get it from there itself. So I'll be sharing this presentation, right? So I'll go ahead from where uh, we are talking right now. And uh, when we talk about change, generally we go through four different phases, which I think most of the faculty members present here, uh, they know about it. Any idea what are those four different phases of transition when we go for change? And as more online courses are being introduced, there is new education policy, there is new NISP policy. So there are a lot of changes which are being happening in most of the institutions. Right. So my question comes to you again. What are different phases of transition that we go through in change? Vinita, ma'am, Sushil, sir, if you can just answer or Gravardhan, sir, if you can answer. When we go for a change in your process and systems in the institution, what are the different signs in each phase that we have? Yeah, I think nobody wants to share it. Right. So I'll start. OK, thank you so much, Amritesh, sir, for taking the lead. And you said resistance, adjustment, adoption, implementation. Very good, sir. I'll add one more thing, Amritesh sir, here. Before resistance comes the denial part. So regardless of whether that change would be positive or negative, our first reaction is, please don't tell us. We are happy in our particular comfort zone. So even if we are not saying in front of the management, but inside we are again and again saying the same thing, please don't change those process and systems. We are happy where we are. So it first starts with denial and then goes to resistance. And if you see on the slide, this this denial and second resistance, this is basically due to our past focus thinking where we are glorifying the past. And in 
resistance mode we are in a fear zone so if you are too much into this glorifying the past this is where we'll see a lot of things like we'll be in a complaining mode we'll be doubting our own ability sometimes we'll get angered very easily we'll be become stubborn also in this particular case but the moment the moment we come in the present focus thinking and take few things from the past and then plan to go into the third stage which amritesh sir has written as adjustment and adoption i would say the third stage here would be exploration and when we enter this third stage of exploration we are in a stage of experimenting or discovering new things so when we talk about this new education policy or nisp also there are certain pointers that we have to follow in our particular institutions if you are impl- implementing those things religiously right so if you are doing it obviously when we are doing it for the first time we are doing a lot of experimentations or discoveries and when we are doing it in terms of those experimentation you can well understand and you can well feel it there would be chances that a lot of failures would be there less of the times you will be facing that particular success but as this stage comes where you face a lot of failure in exploration stage which is called as adjustment and adoption most of the people will again go back to resistance so from exploration they'll go back to the past part but there would be at least 5 or 10 percent people who in spite of those particular failures in spite of those chaos indecisiveness they'll be able to variate their particular energy supply and they'll take it as a challenge and they'll be able to come to the last stage which amritesh sir has written it as implementation i'll write it as commitment so in spite of those failures in spite of those gaps they'll be able to come up to the last stage which is commitment in which they'll become more focused they'll be able to work with team and cooperation so this is how we'll go through those four different stages whatever changes happens in terms of processes or systems in any particular institution or in any particular organization also so based on this if we see the transformation point is when we move from resistance to exploration and uh, generally when we are in denial and uh, resistance we are having a fixed mindset and in ca- case of fixed mindset we have a low stability high chaos is there high emotional stress is there control becomes a major issue high undirected energy would be there we'll glorify the past conflict will increase and resistance will start to build whereas in growth mindset where we are experimenting new things will become more stable and resilient high adversity quotient would be there control will be overpowered by discovery and we'll be able to moderate energy supply in situations future oriented course of mind and actions would be there we'll be able to resolve conflict and the last is very interesting which is joy of confusion now all of you understand confusion either breaks you or it makes you so if you start enjoying that particular confusion that discovery and experimentation part it will not become as a task for you it will become as a challenge for you and somehow out of that joy of confusion you'll be able to reach the last stage which is called as commitment stage so based on this if we see the progressive mindset it is basically built on four dimensions first is self diagnosis where we do a self analysis and we ask questions to ourselves in terms of do people see me as an effective person or do people feel safe in my particular company or or these are two questions that i have said but there might be other questions that you have to ask yourself in order to know which will trademark you whether you are progressive in mindset or not second is listening we all understand communication is not about speaking it's also about listening to the other party and third is self control for self control we have to lengthen the space between stimulus and response so there are a lot of examples and one very good example that i always share is a lot of times we receive mail from let's say our colleagues or seniors where we are being written some negative points about our particular performance and in such kind of cases generally we we write the response within half an hour do you think that is the right approach 
do you think that is the right approach when we are writing the response within half an hour? Yes, Ruby, ma'am. No, but we do. And generally, when we do it, we reply to that particular mail because obviously it depends case to case basis how important is that particular mail. And if people know about your performance, your senior's performance also, right? Or to make it more clear to you, if people know that you're a good performer and they know about your manager also, and if that manager has CC'd that mail to almost 10 people, they also know about your performance and your manager performance. In that case, if you think half an hour would be a good, you can say, time period to respond to that particular mail. In fact, I'll request if you can unmute and share Ruby, ma'am. So that's good. Actually, it's not like but generally, if uh, uh, we see some negative uh, comments about ourselves, so we reply immediately. We try to reply immediately, and the comments will be very harsh. And we generally do uh, uh, the mistake that we reply the harsh comments to all that we see uh, are negative. And generally, our response is like that: refer to point number this. This is the response. Refer to point number this. This is the response. And then we feel happy. Then we feel happy. We go and share with our friends. <laughs> have you seen what kind of reply I have given to this particular person? We feel very happy. But somehow it is disturbing us. That is the reason we are talking to 10 different people regarding that. Had it been a case where you have delayed it for at least two hours. Uh, thank you so much, Ruby, ma'am. Can you mute yourself? I think there is some background noise also. Right. So had it been a case where we would have delayed it for at least two hours and maybe then we have tried another one hour, another one hour. The person who has written you such kind of mail will die out of curiosity because that person would be expecting that Miss Ruby would be writing me an email in next one hour or next three hours. So the moment we react to that particular situation, all of you are wise enough to understand the moment we react to that situation, we give the power to the party who has already written the, that particular mail. And the moment we delay that particular response, most of the times that reporting manager or let's say that senior would die out of that provided if the management knows about your performance as well as the other person's performance also. So that is the reason I'm saying delaying that, lengthening that stimulus and response time, that gap time depends on what kind of situations we are facing in our professional life, right? So this is how we have to work on the self-control and lastly is humility. And again, I would say in humility, we have to change our particular orbit from ego to becoming more humble in nature. So that will make us a more progressive in nature. Now let's go to the second part, which is about collaborativeness. And again, when we talk about the second part, collaborativeness, we have to become a facilitator first. And uh, I think a lot of uh, faculty members present here, they might have changed their delivery style of uh, their classes or uh, the sessions also because they might have adopted more of ask approach rather than telling. So rather than talking on one particular topic and telling the students, you might be involving a lot of students in your particular topics also. And you might be involving them in different ways through activities or in terms of involving them in case studies. So we have to become more of a facilitator. Rather than tell, we have to adopt an ask approach. Develop the workforce for the future. We all are working for that. Uh, the reskilling part as well as the upskilling. And uh, any of the faculty members can share what is the difference between upskilling and reskilling? What is upskilling and what is reskilling? Can any one of you please share what is upskilling and reskilling? Let's have some answers in the chat box or 
again no idea ruby ma'am so upscaling is we are in one particular domain suppose if i talk about myself i am in hr and if i am furthering my education in this field i am upscaling and vinitha ma'am has written learning new skills so reskilling would be adding new skills i i'll give you an example if i am into hr and i learn more about uh, power bi and i learn more about tableau which is helping us in analytics so that becomes a reskilling for me so thank you so much harika ma'am for skills learning you are also writing so reskilling is when we add new skills which supports us in our particular current domain also this is how we have to develop ourselves as well as the workforce for the future and uh, third is freedom to build professional networks a lot of institutions uh, nowadays you are also adopting these practices where you are involving people from industry to share those uh, stories or like in, uh, you can say the case studies from the industry which becomes a good learning experience from young creative minds who will be entering the professional world very soon and lastly is actively involving and serving others so gone are the days of the commanding leadership style you have to mix your leadership styles in different situations you can't go majorly for commanding leadership style so this is how we'll become collaborative more collaborative in uh, nature and now comes the last part which is again one of the favorite part which i always say resilience is one thing which every leader should have to survive in this vuka world and for building a resilience we have to work on three different dimensions so three different dimensions are ambiguity threshold second is internal monologue and third is your energy supply so any idea what is ambiguity threshold any idea what is ambiguity threshold i request you to please answer can what is ambiguity threshold i think uh, ambiguity threshold is uh, confusion threshold a lot of uh, ambiguity is lot of confusion which which basically leads to lot of confusion this is what you are saying amritesh sir yes ma'am okay okay to an extent you are right amritesh sir because ambiguity is about when we are facing any uncertain situation and generally in uncertain situations what is our reaction or you can say what is our response when we are facing any uncertain situations how basically we react to that particular thing this anger this confusion confusion and sometimes we go too much into the future also like let's suppose yes. le let's suppose you have asked me to bring in some changes as per new education policy in uh, the current system of your institution right and i am an internal part of your team so generally in such kind of situations i'll jump to conclusions what if if i'll not be able to do this particular thing what will amritesh sir would do or if i am not having a fear of amritesh sir also but in that case of the i can think in this way what if if i'll not be able to do this particular thing so a lot of time we jump to conclusions without being trying it this is where our ambiguity threshold goes down so in order to build that ambiguity threshold we have to first get out of that problem oriented approach and we have to go into a solution oriented approach for which we have to make our internal monologue very positive because if our internal monologue is positive our self talk is positive we will be able to moderate our energy supply in different situations and that will basically help us to build the ambiguity threshold right now it's very easy to talk about this case this in this particular way we will be able to build this ambiguity threshold for this we need abc now what is this abc again i'll unfold it to you what is this abc so a is your a is your activating trigger b is your belief and c is your consequences now here comes another question for you suppose 
I get frightened with any particular new situations very easily. In my case, A plus B would be minus C. And in case of any of the faculty members present here, or let's take an example of Amrit Sir, since he was sharing a few things earlier also, and Ruby ma'am or Vimta ma'am. In their case, their A plus B would be C if they are not frightened with any uncertain situation. So how this ABC will affect Hitesh's performance and how it will help improving the performance of all other faculty members who are present here. I'm giving you an example where Hitesh's performance is going down as his ambiguity threshold is not good. And why his ambiguity threshold is not good? Because his ABC is negative. So any idea how this ABC helps you in building that ambiguity threshold? It's already there on the slide. A is activating trigger, B is belief, and C is consequences. I'm giving you a hint also. B is dependent on A to give you C. So your beliefs are dependent on activating trigger to give you the consequences. No idea. Okay, I'll share the same thing once again. I'll not ask you question on this, but I'll share the same thing. Suppose I am being fa I'm facing an uncertain situation, and my reaction is, "Oh my God, I'm gone. I can't deliver on this particular part." Right. So in the, this particular case, my activating trigger is an setback or shock. Whereas in case of other faculty members, as I gave you an example, they are not taking it as that, that they will not be able to do it, but they take it as a solution oriented approach. And they are saying, whatever might be the situation, their internal monologue is, we'll be able to come up with solutions. So in this particular case, their activating trigger is positive. So if their activating trigger is positive, their attitudes, beliefs, thoughts would be positive. Whereas in case of Hitesh, it would be negative. Since it started with a setback or shock, so he will not be able to perceive things in the right way. His attitude towards others would be not good. He might lose his particular patience also. He might get angered very easily. His thoughts would not be balanced in that particular sense. And that is the reason if you see the C part, which is the consequences, Hitesh might lose his emotional balance and his behavior or actions would not be in the right way. Whereas all of the faculty members would be able to have that emotional balance. And this is how their performance would be better and they'll be able to build their ambiguity threshold. Whereas in case of Hitesh, the ambiguity threshold will go down because he has lost his emotional balance also. So what I mean to say here is if we have to become a resilient leader or a good leader, we have to basically work on four things, which is the conclusion of this entire session. First, we have to keep working on our PCR mindset for continuous improvement. Second is for every critical situations, we have to make our ABC positive, not ABC negative as in case of Hitesh. Third is encourage experimentation and discovery. And fourth is irrespective of any era, develop a philosophy of out with the old and in with the new with an insatiable curiosity to learn. Because I hope all of the faculty members present here understand if we adopt child syndrome, we'll have that insatiable curiosity to learn new things. And the moment we go into a different ego state, parent ego state, which is a part of transaction analysis, I'll not go into that. The moment we are into that, this is where we are not going in with the new. And this is where we are stopping our critical learning. So these are the four things which I always say, which we should do as a professional in order to become a more resilient leader. And if you all allow, we can go for one self-assessment on resilience yourself you can say assessment on resilience if you all allow since we have i think 18 more minutes to go so if you all allow do you want to go with the resilience part self-assessment of your resilience and again we'll be 
uh, opening it into three parts. First was ambiguity threshold, second was your internal monologue, and third was energy supply. Do you want to go with that self-assessment? Can you please unmute and answer, or if you can just write it in the chat box? No responses. Yes, I once again request the faculty members, do you want to end it here itself or do you want to go with a self-assessment of our resilience? Rama ma'am, are you there? Can you help me in uh, finding out a response on this? Or should we end it up here itself? Yes, I request faculty members to please respond. Otherwise, I think the no response would be taken as they are not interested in going with self-assessment, which is perfectly fine with me because it should be acceptable by you. Then only we'll go ahead with that. If you can write down no also, that is also fine. Plus, please do write either yes or no. Otherwise, it becomes a state of confusion for me also. Okay, nobody wants to write yes or no. Let me talk to Rama ma'am and... Uh... Okay, Indu ma'am, yes, please, we are ready for assessment. Okay, fine. So, Indu ma'am, thank you so much for confirming. I'll put it in the chat box. It's open for faculty members who want to try it, they can try it. And who don't want to try it, it's okay for me if they don't want to try it. Right? So, Dr. Ravish, thank you so much. I am sharing it in the chat box. Here comes... Another document which is on your mental resilience inventory. And uh, if you can just download it, open it on your laptops or even your mobile phones, let me know so that I will tell you how you have to fill this particular document. And for this, the scoring would be a bit different from when we talked about assessing your leadership style. Here, the scoring part would be different from that. Since you are going on time, so that is the reason I wanted if you can just attempt this particular assessment also, which is on mental resilience inventory. Page can't found. I'll try it once more. I'll check at my end also. Uh, Pradeep sir, I'll request you to try it once more because it's opening at my end. Okay, you are able to download it, right? Right. So if you have opened the documents, I'll give you the set of instructions. Okay, I think there is some question from one. Uh, okay. Yes, Doc Sub, you have some question. You want to go ahead, please. Okay. So if you open that particular document, there are total 20 statements. Please resend, sir. Okay, so I'm resending the link once again.
here comes the link once again here it is okay if you have opened that document you can uh, see those 20 statements are there in one page and for each of those 20 statements you have to write it in terms of whether you strongly agree with that or agree so the scale is already written on the top of that particular document and you have to fill it up for all those 20 statements in such kind of situations or in such kind of cases whether you will strongly agree agree or uh, somewhat agree or disagree or strongly disagree so the scale is already mentioned there on the top of the page in that word document which is mental resilience inventory document so for all those 20 statements i request you to do it for all those 20 statements and left hand side box is blank for writing that 5 4 3 2 or 1 for those 20 separate uh, statements separately And I hope I'll we'll be able to do it in 10 minutes. Okay, Nivita ma'am has confirmed she has completed. Thank you so much for confirming. Let's wait for another three, four responses. Thank you, Sushil, sir, for confirming. Fine, Dr. Ravish, if the number of questions are going to somewhat agree, doesn't make any difference. But be very honest in uh, replying to that because I'll not be asking you to share your answer sheets with me. This is for your self-assessment. But a request to all faculty members to be very honest while you are answering to those 20 statements thank you among sir for confirming completed now let me go uh, to the scoring part one thing is you have to do the grand total of those 20 statements and had it been a case where you have answered five for each of those statements the total would have come to 100 so you can understand that the total would be that you have scored would be out of 100 so the total would be out of 100 do the grand total and see what is the total that you are getting out of 100. So if you are getting 80% or above, that basically trademarks you as a highly resilient leader. And if your score is between 72 or let's say 60 to 80%, then you have advocate resilience. But if it is less than 60%, 
and that is the time when you have to work more on the resilience part now let's again open it into three parts as i shared with you there are three dimensions in resilience when we talk about building resilience first was ambiguity threshold second was your internal monologue and third was your energy supply so if you see the first seven statements the first seven statements is about your ambiguity threshold the first seven statements is about your ambiguity threshold so one thing is again you do you can do a subtotal of seven statements seven statements means 35 is the maximum marks so out of 35 what you have scored and if your score is 28 and above out of 35 that again is 80 percent then that means your ambiguity threshold is high otherwise we have to work on our ambiguity threshold the first seven statements is ambiguity threshold then 8 to 13 number statement statement number 8 to 13 is total six statements which is about your internal monologue and out of the six statements 8 to 13 if you have scored at least 24 so 24 out of 30 is again 80 percent so if your score is 24 and above where you have total from statement number 8 to 13 then that means your internal monologue is very positive and last as you can well judge it from here statement number 14 to 20 is again seven statements which is about your energy supply so if those seven statements out of 35 again if your score is 28 and above that means you are variating that energy supply in different uncertain situations you are able to moderate that energy supply so this is how we have assessed our three particular dimensions in resilience i hope uh, we all were able to do that grand total as well as subtotal and now we are able to self assess our ambiguity threshold internal monologue as well as energy supply we are able to do that Hope all of us, we are done with that self-assessment. Can you please write it in the chat box if you don't want to unmute and share? Because I think all of you want me only to talk on this. You don't want to become a part of that. I'll take it as done from all of you and let me just call Rama ma'am and we'll end up the session here itself. Let me just call her and inform her regarding this. Uh, Sh Sharda ma'am, you don't have to send it to anybody else. This is for a self-assessment, so you can keep it with you. Hello. Right. So, I just had a word with Rama ma'am. I think she is busy in a meeting. We have uh, Miss Manisha from uh, Nita Chandigarh who is there. So, Miss Manisha, if it is okay, we can uh, end up the session here because it's already 3.57. Thank you so much, Sharda ma'am. And thank you so much, all the faculty members because you are deeply involved in uh, those self-assessments also, which I also enjoyed a lot.